I'm Salvatore Babonis, and this week's Global Social Problem of the Week is Public Resistance to Immunization. Nothing better illustrates the fact that all people share in a single biological society than the epidemiology of immunization. Obviously, we all share each other's germs, which are spread through breathing, touching, kissing, and a myriad other ways. Um, as a result, one person's immunization from germs is another person's immunization from the same germs. When I immunize me, I immunize you. But in many countries today, public resistance to immunization puts the benefits of this so-called herd immunity at risk. Look, in most developed countries today, it's perfectly safe to walk barefoot in public parks, um, at least safe from communicable diseases. You might stub your toe, you might get mugged by a criminal, but you are not going to catch tapeworm parasites that uh, bore into your feet uh, from contact with parasites in the soil, uh, infect your blood and make their way to your intestines where they hook on and grow inside your intestines. Uh, it's also safe to roll around on the grass uh, and then touch your hand to your lips without having to worry that you're going to contract cholera uh, from bacteria you know, in, in the soil. Uh, there are diseases you can catch from soil, but you're not going to catch common communicable diseases. And the reason is that nobody around you in society has those diseases. Uh, if there's no one to catch them from, you can't catch the disease. It's relatively safe to drink from public water fountains, to sit on public toilet seats, even to kiss complete strangers. In general, it's simply safe to go out in public without wearing a mask and rubber gloves because the other people who are there out in public don't have diseases you can catch from them. Well, it's also relatively safe to go without immunization from serious diseases as long as most of the other people around you in society are immunized for you. This is known as herd immunity. Herd immunity uh, arises because a disease cannot spread in a population unless there are susceptible people for it to spread to. Even if one person gets the disease, if that person is surrounded by dozens of people who are all immunized, that disease won't spread from that one person. Uh, so if I live in New York and a disease enters the uh, United States in San Francisco, even if I'm not immunized in New York, the 300 million immunized people between me and San Francisco will prevent that disease from spreading from San Francisco to me in New York. It doesn't take 300 million immunized people. In fact, the immunization of even a portion of the population can break the chain of transmission of disease from an infected person to a person who might not be immunized. Now, the effectiveness of this herd immunity depends on how infectious the disease is. Uh, measles, which is extraordinarily infectious, requires a, an immunization rate of 90 or 95 percent of the population to prevent uh, a, a full-blown epidemic, to, to prevent uh, transmission, continued transmission throughout the population. Other diseases are not quite so communicable. So the common flu requires something like 50% immunization. As long as 50% of the population is immunized against the particular strain of flu that happens to hit, um, everybody else is more or less safe from the flu because the flu won't spread throughout the population if half the population have been immunized. Herd immunity is thus a public good that is susceptible to free riding. A public good is a benefit of some kind that cannot be limited or kept private. Uh, it, it's something that you can't keep to yourself. If you immunize yourself from a disease, you immunize other people 
you can't just keep the benefits of immunization to yourself. You share those benefits with other people. Unfortunately, public goods are susceptible to free riding. Free riding is taking advantage of public goods provided by others. So when you don't immunize, but you live in a population that is largely immunized against a disease, you're free riding on the immunization, on the public good provided by other people. In other words, herd immunity sets up a classic tragedy of the commons in which people prioritize their needs over the needs of the community. The tragedy of the commons, commons uh, arises from uh, 18th century England where common land held in common by a village in which every villager had the right to graze uh, his or her cattle on the common land. Common land tended to become highly degraded. Uh, it, there was no grass on the common land because any time a single blade of grass appeared, everyone wanted to graze their cattle on the common land. Nobody wanted to have to use their own land to graze cattle. Uh, so the tragedy of the commons is that if you have land held in common that everybody can share, it gets overused and as a result is available to no one. Um, other classic tragedies of the commons are uh, fish in the ocean, which uh, have been so overfished that the world's oceans today are largely devoid of large, uh, of large fish. There just aren't fish in the ocean because of the tragedy of the commons. Um, and the ultimate tragedy of the commons perhaps being global warming. Well, herd immunity is also a tragedy of the commons. Uh, it's inconvenient to get immunized for diseases. It may be costly. In some places you have to pay to be immunized, uh, though usually governments subsidize vaccination, at least in developed countries. And it may even be dangerous to get immunized. I mean, all vaccines carry some risk of adverse reaction. Every year, some people die uh, as a result of uh, some kind of allergic reaction to the, uh, to the immunization itself. So there is some risk or inconvenience of getting immunized. There's certainly an incentive not to immunize, uh, whether through laziness or through fear. And as a result, uh, there are people who don't immunize. Attention is focused especially on the measles, mumps, rubella, the MMR vaccine, because many activists allege that it causes autism. Uh, some activists argue that it's not the MMR vaccine itself that causes autism, but that the large number of vaccines given to infants together cause autism, and that MMR as a combined vaccine is part of that uh, confluence of vaccines that's causing autism. Now, I'm not, I'm a sociologist. I, I'm not a biologist or an epidemiologist or a medical doctor. I can't form a judgment on whether vaccines cause autism, but I want to be very clear that the community of professional epidemiologists is absolutely united in the conclusion that vaccines are not linked to autism. Now, many people view vaccination as an individual choice, but when too many people choose not to vaccinate their children, herd immunity suffers. Uh, obviously, this affects the people who neglected to immunize against the disease. So people who are negligent, uninformed, too poor, and even if immunizations are free, people can still be too poor to take a day off work uh, to take their children to get vaccinated. Um, they're also children of parents who refused to uh, to immunize them, to get them vaccinated. So uh, the lack of uh, herd immunity uh, or the, the lack of immunization uh, is not a decision that children make, yet it's something that puts children at risk, uh, parents putting their own children at risk. Uh, well, we might say that that's your own problem. If you want to take the risk of the disease or if you want to put your child at risk of the disease, that's your own business. Uh, after all, uh, we all face risks every day and parents every day have to make decisions about uh, what's good or bad for their children. But less obviously, the decision not to vaccinate affects people who are unable to immunize uh, themselves against the disease. So people who are under immunosuppressive therapy, uh, like 
cancer patients, uh, people with AIDS and other immune disorders, and probably the most photogenic group of uh, people who are at risk of disease, babies who are too young to be vaccinated. So babies under one year of age uh, who have not received the vaccine but can still get the disease. Uh, newborn babies rely on herd immunity to protect them from the disease because they don't have sufficient immunity themselves against the disease. Also, when you put all this together, it's just bad public health. I, I mean, uh, getting beyond the cost-benefit analysis and, and the morality and thinking about, you know, all of these uh, kind of, you know, big moral and scientific issues, it's just unprofessional. Uh, vaccination is a cornerstone of public health and vaccinating our children is certainly uh, good public health. And here's the evidence. I mean, in the United States, uh, vaccination, especially for measles, has become very controversial. Many people believe that measles vaccination is the root of the uh, autism epidemic spreading or, or that has emerged in the country in the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, and so parents, especially relatively well-off parents, uh, well-informed parents uh, are choosing not to vaccinate against measles. Their argument is often that, well, measles isn't around. I've never even seen anyone with measles. The disease is long since gone. And so they don't bother to vaccinate. Well, in January 2015, uh, a out, an outbreak of measles uh, occurred at Disneyland in Southern California in Anaheim. Uh, the, it's suspected, though not proven, that the initial case came from the Philippines. So the strain of measles that spread a, around the U.S. in 2015 was a strain that is common in the Philippines. Of course, uh, people from all around the world go to Disneyland uh, and non-immunized, non-vaccinated uh, children uh, came into contact with this uh, child, unknown child in Disneyland. Uh, 92 children came down with measles in California, and then uh, a scattering of children from the rest of the country. Now, these weren't all children who'd gone to Disneyland. These were both the small, the initial group of children who caught the disease at Disneyland, who then spread it to their non-vaccinated classmates uh, and friends, who then spread it further and spread it further. As with any tragedy of the commons, immunization can be promoted via education, but must be enforced via government. I mean, just think about climate change. It's all great that we educate people to turn off their lights when they leave the room or to uh, you know, buy more fuel-efficient automobiles, but that's simply not sufficient to make sure uh, that we solve the problem of global warming. Uh, voluntary targets simply don't work. And in the same way with immunization, voluntary immunization is not really enough. Uh, governments have to insist on immunization. And the number one way they do that is by requiring immunization in order for children to be able to attend uh, public schools. Now, of course, research should continue into the safety of vaccines uh, and the possibility of any link with autism or with other diseases that we may not yet have understood uh, could be linked to vaccination. But vaccination is so important for the public health that it really can't be left up to individual discretion. Um, every individual must take the risk associated with vaccination in order for the rest of the population uh, to be safe from disease. Unfortunately, in the United States and other developed countries, vaccination is coming to be seen as a matter of personal choice and personal freedom, uh, rather than a matter of public health. Uh, the attitude is very much, uh, I am in charge of myself and my health, uh, not the government. And of course, this is linked to you know, a neoliberal ideology that has originated in the United States and spread to much of the rest of the world that emphasizes individual responsibility for personal outcomes rather than public responsibility for national outcomes. 
But we can see where this leads. Uh, in countries like Pakistan and Nigeria, religious authorities demand the freedom for families to refuse vaccination with dire consequences. Uh, this is a, uh, a polio victim in Pakistan uh, begging for charity uh, on the roadside. Uh, polio is a very real disease in Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, Nigeria, uh, you know, places where the world where it has not yet been eradicated. Uh, it doesn't exist in the West because we have been immunizing people for some 60 years now uh, against polio. Um, it's not that these diseases somehow simply won't come to the West. It's the fact that we immunize, that we force people to immunize against diseases, even diseases that haven't been seen in decades, uh, in order to prevent their reoccurrence. Thank you for listening. I'm Salvatore Babonis. You can find out more about me at salvatorebabonis.com, or you can also sign up for my monthly newsletter on global affairs.